Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for bringing us together again into your presence. What a privilege we have to have you as our Father. We want to thank you, Father, for your love, for your goodness, for your mercy, for your compassion over our lives, your compassion that fails not for your faithfulness that is new every morning. We give you all glory, we give you all honor. We give you all adoration in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, in Luke chapter 24, two of the disciples were on their way to a village called Emmaus from Jerusalem. And you joined yourself into their company and you began to talk with them. A discussion that lasted about a few hours. And the Bible says their eyes, the eyes of the disciples were holding, were held up that they should not know you. All through the discussion, you began to expound to them the things concerning yourself, right from Moses. And yet, they did not know you. But Lord, in your mercy and in your grace, as you began to open, I mean, to... to, to Partake in the communion with them. The Bible says that their eyes were opened and they knew him. And then you vanished out of their sight. Tonight, Lord, we pray and ask, Lord, that you will open our eyes that we might see you, Jesus, that we might know you personally, Lord, from your word in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh. How? By the word of the Lord. Your revelation is not in appearance to man. Your revelation is in your word. And so, Lord, as you have come before you, as you have come, Lord, to learn of you and to study your word, Lord, grant us insight, grant us revelation into your word in the name of Jesus Christ. Let there be an unveiling. Let Every veil covering our eyes be taken away. For the Bible says, nevertheless, when it shall come to the Lord, the veil shall be removed. We thank you. We give you glory. We give you praise. Let your word, Lord, bring us rest. Where there have been unrest, where there have been anxiety. For every heart that is downcast, Lord God, let there be a lifting in the name of Jesus. Father, let your word bring rest to our souls. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. We give you glory. I think it was Jeremiah that said, your words were found. And I did hear them. And they became the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Lord, as we study your word, cause us to find the things that are written concerning us. The word that is in the season. The word that is meant for us today. And as we find it, let those words be the joy and the rejoicing of our heart. We thank you. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor. Because you are ever so faithful. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. I want to thank God for giving us this wonderful privilege to continue in our study in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, we are on chapter number six of Matthew Gospel. And last week we began looking at the principles that the Lord taught us or taught his disciples 
in Matthew chapter 6 um, from verses 1 to 15 I believe uh, those principles regarding arms given regarding arms given we saw the principles on the need for them not to um, to retaliate and we also learned some other principles today so we want to continue in that spirit as we uh, look at Matthew chapter 6 from I'll be reading first and foremost from verses 16 to 18 and I want us to please uh, uh, to follow as I read Matthew chapter 6 from verses 9, um, 16 to 18 to start with Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Um, so the Lord is continuing in the, in the same uh, spirit, with the same principle, by letting us understand the kind of fasting that pleases God. You know, last week we saw the giving um, that pleases God and we also saw the kind of praying that pleases God. And today the Lord is telling us that there is a kind of fasting that God approves of and that the fasting for sure is hypocritical. That's the kind of fasting that the Pharisees um, engaged in in the days of our Lord Jesus Christ, they practiced it. You know, it was a fasting for men to know that they were fasting. So the motive, just like in giving, they wanted to be seen and to be applauded for their giving. And just like as in praying, they like to pray standing, you know, in the corners of the street so that men can see them and hail them as prayer warriors. So also, Christ here is saying, is rebuking the uh, Pharisees because the ulterior motive for their fasting is so that men can know that they are fasting. And how do they do that? You know, when they are fasting, they disfigure their faces. Perhaps, you know, one way of doing that is that they apply ashes on their faces. And we know that in the Old Testament, when they put ashes upon their head, upon their faces, and they wear sackcloth, it's an emblem of, you know, humiliating the soul. It's a way of showing, look, that my soul is being, you know, chastened, and that my flesh is also being humiliated, you know. And they do that usually as a way of mourning. It may be mourning over sin. David did that, and some other people in the Old Testament, when they are mourning for their sin, they put, you know, uh, ashes upon their face or head, and they wear a sackcloth, you know. So, and that's what the Pharisees are accustomed to doing as well. They wear sad face, long, you know, uh, countenance, sad face, for people just to identify that they are fasting. But that's not the kind of fasting that the Lord approves of. And that's why God says, once they do that, they already receive their reward from men. And when we look around us, it's not too, we don't have to look too far to see that there is also a sect of people, primarily, you know, that they like to sound a trumpet or blow a trumpet when they are fasting, during their Ramadan, you know, fast. You know, the Muslims, you know, they, when you want to shake them, when you want to, you know, come close to them, so, you know, sometimes, you know, they are very quick to tell you, look, look, don't 
make me do something that will break my fast. See, I'm fasting. It's, it's, this is the time of Ramadan, you see. And when people do that, and if a Christian does that, actually, what the Lord is saying here is that he has already received this reward, you know, by whatever credit people or praise is accorded to them. You know, but if we want God to reward our fasting, then we have to do it according to the way our Lord Jesus Christ um, has instructed in verse 17 and 18, saying, But that when thou fastest, anoint your head and wash your face. Make yourself look beautiful. Make yourself look glorious. You know, so that nobody knows that you are fasting. And then he says, when God sees your fast, you know, and that you are fasting in secret, then God can reward us openly. Um, it, the, there's a fasting that God chooses, and I want us to have an idea, an inkling into the kind of fasting that God approves of us or approves of the believers in Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Let me quickly read from uh, um, verse 6 down to verse 11. It's not this, the fast that I have chosen. So I want us to take note that there is a chosen fast. There is a fast that God reckons with. Say to lose the bands of wickedness. And how do we do that? We pray. Essentially, we pray. It's by prayer we do that. So God says, when we are fasting, in the sense of we are depriving ourselves of food, and we are not really losing the bands of wickedness, it's, it's, it's not a choosing fast. So when we are fasting and we are praying such that the bands of wickedness can be loosed, then that's a choosing fast. So to lose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heaven, heavy burdens, heavy burdens upon our lives. These might be spiritual burdens. They might be emotional burdens. You just want to be unburdened. Maybe there's so much fretting and anxiety and all that. And because of that, he said, look, I want to fast so that that burden can be loosed. Yeah, that's an appointed fast. That's a chosen fast, you know. Either for our lives or we are doing that too on behalf of others, you know, is part of a choosing fast. And to let the oppressed go free. So we fast for freedom. We fast for deliverance. Either personal deliverance. We wait upon the Lord and say, Lord, I'm fasting. There is an aspect of my life that has come under a demonic influence. And it should not be. And for that reason, I am fasting for deliverance. That's a choosing fast. That's a choosing fast. And that you break every yoke. That's a choosing fast. This is the kind of productive fast that the Lord wants us to engage in. A fast to break every yoke. A fast, you know, for liberty and for deliverance. Verse 7. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? And that thou bring the poor that are cast out to your to the house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from your own flesh. The Lord is extending this fast beyond the call of prayer or the call to pray. The very first aspect is talking about we praying spiritual fast when we are praying for deliverance for liberty to undo. Uh, um, heavy burdens and to lose bondages around us or around others. But there is also a kind of fast which is denying ourselves of certain privileges in order to be a blessing to others. So the spirit of our seven is self-denial. It's a kind of a fast. In other words, God is saying, look, the fast I've chosen is not just limited to not eating food. When we deprive ourselves of certain things in order to be a blessing, it says to deal our bread to the ungly. You know, that's giving. 
bringing the poor that are cast out to the house is inconveniencing, might be inconveniencing for us, but hospitality to the poor. We are depriving ourselves of the comfort of, you know, maybe our bed of our room by sharing it with, you know, others. That, that's part of the appointed fast. When we see the naked, covering the naked, you see? So you are denying yourself, you know, certain privileges in order to be a blessing to others. You know, covering the naked is part of the, you know, uh, the fast that God has chosen. And then that we hide not ourselves from our own flesh. So, so, so the, the, you know, the idea of fasting here, brethren, you know, is that it goes beyond not just, uh, uh, just not, not just for us to deprive ourselves of food. We need to fast from things, for instance, like tele from television. If there are things that are luring us or, you know, uh, luring, luring us away from our devotion to Christ. Games, for instance. You know, maybe you just got that you're getting addicted to playing games. You know, we know that watching TV or playing games in themselves, they're not wrong. But there is a way that we begin to come under the influence. You know, Paul says all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. So we must know when our liberty in Christ begin to go beyond, uh, you know, the boundary of expediency. Even though those things in themselves, they are lawful, they are not wrong, they are not sinful. But the moment you begin to get addicted to things, and the moment you begin to come under the power and the influence of things, that's the time to fast. And that's what the Lord is saying here. That's the time to fast, to come apart from those things, to deny self from those things. So it's a kind of a fasting, and it's very, very important. It's a choosing fast. So when we fast, brethren, let's do it in conjunction with praying. Let's do it in conjunction with studying the word and meditating upon the word. And that makes our fasting very, very potent. And very, very effective. Otherwise, if you are fasting and you really can't pray and you cannot study or meditate upon scriptures, then you have actually reduced that fast to hunger strike. Now, we cannot fast in order to, because the mentality for most of us is a lot of times when we fast, is because we want to get something from God. So, okay, let me go on a fast. There is a particular thing that I want. I want to go on a fast. Um, let's not use fast as a, 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 a bait or as a means of getting, it's almost like you are, you are trying to bribe God, you know, with a fast. You know, that mentality is wrong. God does not design fasting for that. We're not saying that if there is a need, we cannot fast, you know, so for God to intervene. We can, of course we can. You know, when we need God's uh, intervention in a situation, maybe somebody is sick or something happening, and we are fasting on that purpose. Yes. It is recommended, it is acceptable. But let's not have the mentality that it is our fast that is going to make God to come to our rescue. No. It's not our fast that's making, because fast primarily is designed, you know, to humble the body. It's not designed as, a, uh, as something, as a mechanical tool. If I can use that word, you know, to 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 curry God's favor. No. Fast must not be seen as something that you do so that God can, you know, favorably respond to our need. No. That's a very wrong mentality. The idea of fasting is to humiliate, if I can use that word, the flesh, to chase, to chasten the flesh so that the spirit can come alive. It is to discipline the flesh so that our human spirit can come alive. And when your human spirit is, you know, is charged, then you can pray effectively. When the Holy Spirit is speaking to your human spirit, then you are alert. So, you, you know, your spiritual sensitivity is enhanced to hear the voice of the Spirit. And your prayer is much more potent when your human spirit comes alive. And that is what God designs uh, fasting for. It is to help us. You know, to position us in a place where we can pray better. It does not add or remove from God at all. And it does not 
give us any particular sense of entitlement before God. Oh, because you are fasting, that, that means our prayer will be answered. No. It's very important for us to understand that. I will only read, uh, I think, Psalm 33. Uh, Psalm 33, verse 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth when they were sick. He was praying now. This is talking about, uh, I think, uh, David. Say, but as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting. And my prayer returned into my own bosom. I humbled my soul with fasting. That's all he's designed for. So that then my spirit can come alive. And then my prayer also, you know, can 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 go up, you know, uh, uh, unto God. I, since they're in the same Psalms, let me quick, uh, as, I may as well just read uh, Psalm 69, verse 10. Psalm 69, verse 10. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. Everywhere you see it in scriptures, it is always something intended to put the body and the soul under, to chasten them, to humble them, so that the spirit can come alive. That's what God designs fasting for. Now let's read uh, Matthew 6, verses 19 to 24. As we begin to see the Lord talking to us about an important topic, brethren. A lot of people are afraid that, you know, preachers, they don't like to talk about money. But I've seen in scriptures that the things that we are often afraid to talk about, particularly amongst, you know, uh, the Christians, they are the things that the Lord Jesus Christ emphasized the most in scriptures. One is hell. There is no one who talks about hell in the New Testament more than Christ. No, check it. He devoted copious verses and passages in scriptures about hell. The same thing about money, treasures. Jesus emphasizes, you know, uh, 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 treasures and riches and wealth in the Bible. And that's just to show how important it is. The thing the Lord is emphasizing is, you know, are things that are important for us. To understand them. Matthew 6 verses 19 to 24. Let's see what the Lord has to say about riches. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Where moth and rust doth corrupt. And where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. And where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. How do we gain mastery over mammon? How do we gain mastery over mammon? That's one to look at in this section. Now the first verse we read in verse 19, the Lord says, we should not lay up treasure for ourselves here upon the earth. But we should rather lay up our treasure in heaven. Why? Because our treasures are securely guarded when they are in heaven. In heaven, thieves can't break there. There can't be burglary in heaven. And there are no rust in heaven that can corrupt them. So, they are imperishable if we lay them up in heaven and they are securely guarded. We can't lose them and they cannot depreciate in value. And that is why we have to lay up our treasures in heaven. However, if all we are doing, using 
our energy, our strength, our drive, our passion, our giftings to acquire possessions and here on earth to build them up here and stockpile them here on earth. Let us remember the fact that we are setting ourselves up for disappointment. It is as simple as that. If all we are doing is laboring to you know, lay up treasures here on earth, we are setting ourselves up for the disappointment in the sense that those treasures, they will diminish in value over time. They will diminish in value over time. Those that do not diminish in value over time, you know, they will be corrupted by wrath. Wrath will corrupt them, you know, you know. There is the risk that thieves can break in and steal our possessions. We are confronted with this risk. You know, we are confronted with this risk. And ultimately, brethren, there are two other things that await them. Either that when our time here on earth is up, the Lord calls us home. And like what First Timothy chapter 6 says, we have brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we cannot carry anything out. It is certain. There is a certainty. So all of those things that we have acquired, we leave them behind. You know, Solomon talks about an evil under the sun, a man to whom God has given wealth, riches, and all that, so that his soul does not, you know, lack anything that is highest desire. But yet it's another man. He dies and he goes away. And yet it's another man who has not even labored. That now comes to begin to enjoy it. That is another certainty that confronts people who are stockpiling wealth here on the earth. And Apart from that also, even if somebody leaves this leaves, leaves, leaves and says, look, I'm, I'm going to live as long as I can. There's also another certainty that a day is going to come when the heavens and the earth, they are going to be burnt up by fire. And everything that man has set up and reared up and labor to achieve, everything will be burnt up. So these are the realities, brethren, that confront us. Um, Philippians chapter 4, verse four, uh, 17 tells us where we should be sending our treasures, where we should be laying our treasures to. Philippians chapter 4, verse 17. Not because I desire gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. He's talking now about a spiritual account that we ought to have opened. If you are born again, you should have a spiritual account against your name in heaven where you can be doing transfers from the earth. And your transfers can be accruing to your spiritual account. That's what Paul is saying here. So I desire gifts that will abound, uh, fruit that will abound to your account. And then, but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, and other of a, a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. How are those accounts funded? Through givings. Through givings. It's very important. Paul is commanding them, I've received from you sacrifice. Your giving, your charitable works towards me. And that has enabled me also in the ministry, you know, to pour into, into your lives, you know, to, 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 to serve you so much so that you are now fruits that are abounding in my own account in heaven. And then verse 18, say, but I have all and abound. I've read that. Verse 19, say, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We are very swift to quote that promise. But the condition is equally as uh, necessary. In this church, they were given church. They were a blessing. And then he prayed for God to supply their needs. 
But the emphasis, brethren, is that we need to have an account in heaven with God where we can be making deposits by virtue of the things we are given, you know, our, our obedient giving here on earth. How do we ensure that our, our treasures are laid up in heaven? I've mentioned it is by primarily is by giving as uh, led by God. Uh, there is this saying that people say, you can't take it with you, you can't take it with you. The answer is, yes, you can. They say, well, all these things that you are having, you know, you have here on earth, why not enjoy them here? Because if you die, your house, your car, and all that, why not make, you know, enjoy them? Because if you die, you can't take them. And of course, First Timothy 6 says, we can't carry it. It's true. We cannot carry them away. But brethren, we can send them ahead of us. If I had to go back to, sorry, if I had to travel to Africa, for instance, or maybe maybe Nigeria, if I had to travel and I don't want to carry cash with me, it's very, very easy, you know. I have a bank account back at home. I just make transfers from here. Obviously, if I'm going to need money there, I transfer and the transfer goes ahead of me. And then when I get home there, you know, I don't need, I don't need to carry anything. I have resources available for me to use. And that is the wisdom for us, brethren. As much as we brought nothing to the world, and when we go, we can't carry possessions with us. We can't carry our treasures. We can send a transfer ahead of us before we get to heaven. And that is what the Lord is saying. Say when he says, lay up treasure in heaven, the how of it is by the transfers you make ahead before you get there. And there are two parables that the Lord uses to emphasize the same truth. The first one is the uh, parable of the rich fool. Um, I won't, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a parable I believe we are familiar with. It's just the principle that the Lord uh, is stating that I will emphasize. You know, remember the, uh, the, uh, the rich man who had, whose ground brought, brought forth plentiful goods, you know, and um, he wanted to uh, uh, build a barn where I can store up for days to come, you know, so that I can be self-sufficient. He had that sense that, look, I have enough, so I don't need any. And indeed, that is what he said to himself, you know. So he pulled down the small band that he had, and he built a greater band. And then he commanded that all his, uh, 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 the fruits from the ground and all of his goods that he had, that they should warehouse them and keep them there. And he said to him, his soul, my soul, take your rest. You know, now you have more than enough to live on for the rest of your soul. And while he was re re reveling, you know, in, in his uh, material prosperity, a voice came to him and said, you are a fool. Tonight, your soul is demanded uh, from you. And then the Lord gave us a, uh, the same principle in Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 33 to 34. Sell that you have. Luke 12, 33, yes. And give arms. Provide yourselves bags which was not old. A treasure in the heavens that faileth not. Where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupted. Treasures in heaven that does not fail. Here, treasures can fail. Money fails. We saw in Egypt that money failed. They had money, they couldn't buy food. And there are times too that when money fails in economy, similarly in our contemporary culture, inflation is so high, you have money, you know, you can't even buy anything with it. Money is failing. Treasures fail, and thieves can approach, mud can corrupt. Verse 34 say, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I'll come to that in a minute. And then there's a, a second parable, the parable of the unjust word. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, the unjust word. Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, an interesting parable. One that divides opinions, even among Christians. Remember the rich man. Uh, the Lord gives us an account of a very wealthy man, Lord, who, you know, called his servant 
uh, you know, an accusation was made concerning his servant that he was wasting his goods. And the Lord of that servant called his servant and said, look, I, I want to uh, uh, give me an audit. Uh, you know, uh, I want to audit your, 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 your account. You know, uh, give me an account of your stewardship. Because you are going to be relieved if the accusation that I've had concerning, you, you know, your, your, your deeds, if they are true. And then the steward began to reason within himself, look, if I'm relieved of my position as a steward, how am I going to survive? Say, I cannot beg, maybe by reason of his, uh, uh, maybe age or whatever, we're not told. Say, I can't beg. Say, and, or oh, I cannot dig, you know. Say, I can't dig, I can't beg. And I am ashamed, you know, to beg. And then he thought within himself, I have now decided I've resolved. This is what I'm going to do. When I'm put out of stewardship, you know, so that I can be received into the houses, I will ingratiate myself to my Lord's debtors. I'm going to, you know, uh, 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 curry their favor by being good to them, by being nice to them ahead. So what did he do? He began to call his uh, Lord's debtors unto him. And he asked him, the first one, how much do you? And the debtor said, look, I, I, I owe your master 100 measures of oil. In fact, let me read from verse 6. And he said, 100 measures of oil. And he said unto him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Verse 7. Then said he to another, how much owes thou? And he said, 100 measures of wheat. And he said unto him, take your bill, write for score 80. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of life. That's the vast that astounds many believers. See, what on earth is the Lord saying there? Is he commending dishonesty? No. He's not commending his action. The Lord is commending the principle that he applied. He's not commending what he did. He was clearly fraudulent and dishonest. But the Lord was commending there is a particular principle this young man was or this steward was applying is that principle the lord was commending not what he did his actions and then he went on in verse 9 and i said unto you make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness take note how the lord describes money there or, or, or wealth he calls it mammon of unrighteousness, or unrighteous mammon. That when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you to your trust that true riches? Take note, there is the unrighteous mammon which is contrasted with the true riches. So there is the unrighteous riches and there are true riches. Verse 12. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, we shall give you that which is your own. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Wonderful, wonderful principles. The passage is loaded with principles. But time would fail me to go through them one after the other. Great, great truths of scriptures. Great truths. What's the Lord saying here? In commending the principle applied and not necessarily the dishonest and not actually the dishonest act of this steward, what the Lord is saying is, as God's children, Use your present position here on earth. Because the steward knew his job is at risk. So he colluded with the debtors to reduce his master's receivables. So that when he's thrown out of stewardship, they can accept him into his house. And look after him and take care of him. The master also saying, why are you here on the earth? He's talking to his disciples while you are here on the earth. Use your positions, your status, your possessions. All the opportunities God has given you, your leverage that he has given you. 
send them ahead of you to heaven. Use them to promote the cause of heaven, the cause of heaven, while you are on earth. Use them to advance heaven's cause. So that when you get to heaven, say when you when you fail there, simply means for the steward, when he's thrown out of stewardship, when he's discharged from stewardship. For a believer, when he dies, that is when we are discharged. The Bible uses death as, as discharge. Say in this war, in this, this you know, war of death, there, you know, you know, you say there's you know there's this you know, no discharge or something. Like that. You know, so when you when you fail means when you die, they are waiting for your head in heaven. That's the principle. You cannot carry it, but you can send it ahead of you. And then they will be waiting for you to receive you into the everlasting habitation, which is heaven. Their treasures are, have gone ahead. That's the principle the Lord is saying, is commanding here. And it is the thing that the wisdom too, that he wants us to apply as God's children. Of course, the wisdom this steward applies is a diabolical or intellectual wisdom. It's a natural wisdom. It is what the world calls smartness. But we know that it's unrighteous, it's ungodly, it is sinful. But the wisdom of God is that we should also use our possessions and, and uh, all our God-given talents to promote heaven's, heaven's kingdom and to lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven. So that when we leave this place, those things have gone ahead of us and they are waiting to receive us. The angels, they are waiting to receive us. The saints that have gone ahead of us too, who are seeing our commitment, our devotion to Christ too, they are also waiting to receive us. They say, when you fail, you know, say that they will be waiting there to receive you, referring to those that have gone ahead of us, uh, who are waiting um, to receive us. And then he said we should make to assess friends by the means of unrighteous mammon. Some of that commentators interpreted that verse to mean the poor people that you are helping now with heaven's resources, you know, as led by the Spirit, you are blessing them. They are the friends that you are using, that you are making for yourself by uh, by the means of money. And when you die, you know, you still meet them ahead of you, you know, waiting to receive you also into everlasting habitation. Another principle the Lord is telling us here, brethren, is that we need to be faithful in that which is least. A lot of us think, oh, it is when I become a millionaire, that's when I can give more. No, the least, the little. Faithfulness in the little. Faithfulness in it. it is when I have, maybe I'm working for myself and I have more time. That's when I will evangelize. That's when I know. Faithfulness in the little. Even with the little time you have now, when you come, you know, even with the little time, God requires faithfulness. God does not promote us to big things until he has proved us in little things. All through scriptures, that principle is very, very key. No, it does not. That's why you see some people, they are anointed, they are gifted. You see so many things, you know, but yet for them to make that step up to great things in life is difficult. Why? God is trying them in the little with all the giftings that he has given them and the anointing upon them. He has not found them faithful for it is required in stewardship that a man should be found faithful. If he's not faithful in the stewardship, in the resources that he has given him, you know, and God is always proving and trying. Believe me, there's no promotion. He does not place a man that he has not proved. No, all through scriptures. So look, Joseph was proved. All of those times, you know, when he was in Potiphar's house, and um, Mrs. Potiphar said, come and lie with me. This is proving, this is testing. If he had failed it, he would now become a prime minister next to Pharaoh. Uh, uh, yes, he would not have been. Those are his little, little provings. Everyone he places, he proves. The only one we find a record that was not proved and was placed was Adam in, in garden. There was no proving. It was not a process of discipline. It was not a process of, of, of uh, it was not a product of process. He didn't go through developmental process. He was a full grown man and he found himself in the midst of wealth, affluence. He couldn't handle it. And that's why he fell. And after that time, Everyone that God will make great in the kingdom, He takes them through provings and processes to prove what is in them, to prove their loyalty, their faithfulness. And then He now commits great things to their hands. Another example is Daniel. When they were giving him 
This was a boy coming from royalty. He was born in the palace. He found himself in a strange land. And they now gave him palatial food. How be it? These are forbidden uh, meat. Forbidden according to the uh, 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 Jewish uh, dietary laws. He could have said, well, that was uh, in Israel. Now I'm in Babylon. Let me eat it. No. He proposed in his heart, I will not defy myself with the portion of the king's meat. And God said, yes, that's your proving. That's the testing. I know you are also going to be a prime minister, you know, in Babylon. But I needed to prove you in the little. When he passed it, God placed him. Check it through scriptures. There is no one that he places to greatness without proving them. And when he proves them, he proves them in little, little stuff. Things that they can easily come and say, well, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. When they fail it, he keeps them on the same spot. So we see that principle there. And then we went uh, on also and said, until we are faithful in that which is in another man's. You see, everyone is going to be their own boss. Can we, can we, uh, okay, now. Okay. There, there is a noise in the background, please. Can we ensure that that's uh, not the case, please? Another principle the master has taught us is in verse 12. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, we shall give to you that which is your own. That is also equally very important. Faithfulness in that which is another man. Before you can have a, a job and be your own, your own employer, your own boss, you must have proved your faithfulness in that which is another, another person's uh, job. And, uh, you, know, you must have. That's the principle. You must have served faithfully. Serving as if it is the Lord you are serving, not man. Not with eye service. Doing it, whether the boss is there or not. You are doing it as unto God, conscientious about it in terms of timekeeping, in terms of excellence, you know, in terms of you know commitment, doing it as if it's your own. When you don't do another man's work as though it is your own, you can't have your own. Even if you are have your own, you can't make so a success of it. That's the principle. Many people today they want to go into ministry, say, Hey, I want to be a pastor, I want to be no. And they have not served. They have not poured themselves into another man's vision. You can't. It's not possible. It's a principle of scriptures. It is after you have served and you have poured that God now releases you and he gives you into your own. And then let me go to the next point on gaining mastery over mammon. It says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's true. That's true. Where our treasure is. You can always know where our, our treasure is by knowing what is it that our heart is obsessed with. What is it that occupies our heart? That is where our treasure is. That which feeds our heart, that which occupies our heart, that which we hold dear to our heart is an indication of where our treasure is. You will become like the gods that you worship. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in Luke chapter 17, verse 13, he said, very little word of admonition, you know, in Luke 17, verse 32, say, remember Lot's wife. The ending of Lot's wife is a tragic story of a woman who, though physically speaking, had left Sodom and Gomorrah. Her treasure was still in Sodom. And because her treasure was there, her heart did not leave. So she was looking back to where her treasure was. And she could not go all out according to the word of God. And she became a pillar of salt. That is, the, that is what happened. You see, where, uh, if, our heart is in, if our treasure is in the world, our heart will be in the world and 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 the treasure will be pulling the strings of our heart so strongly that at the same time our heart cannot be totally committed to god that's the way it works so when jesus is saying lay up your treasure in heaven he knows what he's saying if you are sending money home and you are building for instance let you just imagine it 
you have land, you know, back in Nigeria, you have, if, you know, God has blessed you and you're able to buy a property, you know, your heart is always longing to go there. Why? Because you have a treasure there. If you have nothing there, you know, why do you say, sometimes you say, okay, even if I'm going to go, where am I going to stay? So if you have, your treasure is here, your heart will be here. And your heart can't be here and be, you know, in heaven at the same time. You know the reason why many people are not expecting the coming of Jesus? Even if they say, well, we know he's coming, it's just a lip service. Their hearts are not panting and not expecting. It's because they don't have a treasure there. There's nothing to look up to heaven for. There is no expectation that if I get there, there's something that's waiting ahead of me. They don't have that expectation. And uh, you know what the Bible says? Every time you see, when they talk about the coming of Jesus, he said, and to them that eagerly await is coming. So it's not coming for everybody. Let's not deceive ourselves. Jesus is not coming for every believer. I know that it may sound uh, shocking to some of us. It's not. No. The Bible never says it's coming for every believer. It said to those who eagerly await is coming. It is those who have an expectation, who are expectant, who are waiting for his coming. They are the ones that he's coming for. Let's check it. In scripture, it's there. It's not just coming for everyone. It's coming for those who eagerly, eagerly. And they are eagerly awaiting because they know that there's something at stake awaiting for them in heaven. I pray that the Lord will give us understanding. Now, in, the Lord also went further on to tell us in, uh, that uh, where we've read in Matthew chapter 6 that there is a need for our eyes to be good. And I quickly want to explain that. There is a need for eyes to be good. It says that, verse 22, says, The light of the body is the high. If therefore your eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. One way of looking at it is a single eye can be focused, you know, you know, vision, you know, which is, which is, which is fine. But if thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is indeed be darkness, how great is that darkness? But when we look at the original words, uh, you know, uh, uh, Greek words that are used, that have been interpreted for us there, what does that, these metaphors that the Lord has used, what do they mean? Now, the body there uh, represents the soul or the inner man, the body. You know, it says the light of the body is the eye. So the body can uh, represent the soul of the man or the inner man, you know. And then the eye there, you know, um, represents the gaze of, of the soul and can also represent the heart of the man. So the word good there, when, you know, the word good there represents in Greek means simple, single, uncomplicated. So when it says that if your eye be single, actually means if your eye be good, a good eye, a good eye, or a single eye is a good eye. And then the word bad there, when it says that um, if the high be uh, uh, bad, can also mean wicked or evil in, uh, in Greek, you know. So in the scriptures, and this is very, very uh, important, brethren, the expression evil eye, every time you see evil eye, and it's used in so many places, you know, verses, you know, in the, in the, in, in the Bible, evil eye and evil eye. It's a phrase that is common among the Jewish people. Even when you're talking to someone and say, oh, somebody has got an evil eye, they know what it means. It simply means covetousness. It means envy. For somebody to have an evil eye, it's a way of saying that it's a covetous uh, uh, person. You know, it's a covetous person. Let me quickly um, read Matthew, I think, 2015, just to corroborate this point. And then we move on. Matthew 20, uh, verse 15. It is not lawful for me to do that. What I will with my own is that I evil because I am good. And these are people who are complaining, you know, oh, uh, why are you paying? We started in the morning. Some people, you call them to come and work and you are giving us the same wage. They are envious. And Jesus said, if your eye is evil, then why, why are you, why are you, uh, uh, complaining about the good that I've done. So it's always used in the context of covetousness. So these two verses, what's the explanation then? If the art or gaze of the soul be good or single, you know, that's what it means that 
you know, if your if your uh, eyes be uh, single, if the heart or the gaze of the soul be uh, single, single in, in its uh, in its love for God and in the things of God is focused on God, then that's a good eye. The good eye is a eye that is single-minded in its focus, in its gaze upon God and in the things of God. And when that is the case, that our eye is good, then our soul will be our body, will be filled, uh, filled with light. In other words, we'll experience uh, God's goodness, we'll experience the righteousness of God, we'll experience the truth. You know, but if the heart or gaze of the soul be evil, if it is evil, you know, in the sense of uh, full of envy or co covetousness, if you are covetous, then one soul will be filled with darkness. And darkness, of course, being the opposite of light, means there will be selfishness, there will be wickedness, and there will be uh, falsehood. So to keep our eye good, brethren, therefore, we must guide what goes into our eye. That is what we allow our eyes to dwell upon. We must receive grace to be free from covetousness and to be rich towards God. Um, I will read, and it's a very, very important scripture. Please permit me to read it. Luke chapter 12. Luke 12, verses 15 and uh, 21. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Jesus is saying that a man's life is not measured. The worth of living, you know, is not measured by what one possesses. Unfortunately, our contemporary culture, and many Christians too have fallen into that trap, they tend to estimate their self-worth by the things that they have. Say, well, um, because I am earning this much, I should be driving this kind of car. Because I am, you know, earning this much, I should be living in this kind of a house. And then they now begin to, you know, uh, uh, they begin to, what gives them is uh, their self-worth is derived from the things they have, the things they possess. What gives them is a, a right perspective of who they are. You see, the, 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 the estimation of, of their own self is based on what they possess. That's what Jesus is saying. A man's life does not consist is not determined by the abundance of his possession. Because true prosperity begins with the presence of God. That's true prosperity. It's not measured by material possessions. Now, another important principle that the Lord has taught us here um, is the fact that Christ placed God on the same pedestal as Mammon, where I read earlier. He said, we cannot love, uh, verse 24, it says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and hate the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and Mammon. Why? Is Jesus placing mammon side by side with God? The reason is because a lot of people are making mammon their God. And in fact, mammon desires, you know, the worship and the loyalty of a God from everyone who serves it. Mammon is that powerful that it wants to be treated as dirty. And that is why the Lord is placing them side by side with God. But of course, you know, in Exodus 34, verse 14, when the Lord gave the commandment, say, you shall serve no other God besides me. So God demands absolute loyalty. But unfortunately, you know, Mammon is also seeking for worship. The issue here is not that the Lord God is against wealth. Let's not get it wrong. The Lord does not forbid us from, you know, being wealthy or having material possessions. No, be far from it. The issue here 
in question here is who do we serve? Who do we worship? Say you cannot serve God and Mama. You can't serve both at the same time. So the question is of service, of worship, and not necessarily whether we uh, need to have uh, uh, wealth or not. Mammon is an Aramaic, or some people say it's a Syriac, or from Syria, word for possessions or wealth in, in the language that, you know, that was widely spoken in the days of Elijah's Aramaic, which is a combination of, uh, you know, I think Hebrew and some other uh, uh, language. Uh, when they say mama, mama refers to wealth or money, if you like. You know, it also refers to the name of the God of riches or money. So when wealth is coveted and becomes the priority in our lives, it becomes a God. When we covet wealth and it becomes a priority, then that is when mammon becomes a God. Because of time, I'm going to stop here. Um, it's not something I want us to rush through. Next uh, time, by God's grace, we'll look at what's the characteristics of wealth. What is it that makes mammon destructive? Pitfalls that we need to watch out for, you know, concerning mammon. And then we'll also, by God's grace, con uh, conclude by looking to the prescriptions that the Lord gave us on how we can overcome worry. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you for yet another privilege you have given us to come and learn of you. We want to thank you, Father, for these great truths that you are opening our eyes to. Lord, on the need for us to gain mastery over mammon. Thank you, Father, for also challenging us, the need for us to lay our treasures in heaven and not here on earth, because we are treasures, we be are, that's where our heart will be. It's our prayer, Lord, and the cry of our heart, Lord, that you will enable us by your spirit, Lord, to begin to set our affections on things that are above and not on things here in heaven, on, 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 on earth, in the name, mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we also pray and ask, Lord, that you help us that to persistently maintain a very good high, an eye that is single minded, a high whose gaze is upon the Lord and upon the things of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, that you deliver us from covetousness, you deliver us from wanting to grasp and grasp and grasp, wanting to acquire, 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 but rather you give us grace, Lord God, to exercise godliness with great contentment in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, we honor you, we bless you. Also, Lord, we want to thank you, Father, for grace to fast and to fast consistently, to fast as a lifestyle in the name of Jesus. And in our fasting, help us to fast according to the way you have chosen it. Fast that will be productive. Fast, O oh God, Lord, that will make praying and the study of, war, uh, of the word effective. Help us to engage in such in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you because you know you have answered our prayers. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Amen.